Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session on introduction to yoga. And um, shall I start, Sudhika? Yes, Swami. So I'm really happy because this is the first session of our yoga week leading up to the uh, yoga day on Sunday. And uh, we've got a lot of uh, really good sessions offered every day at this time, 5 to 6. And then on Saturday at um, 7 a.m., I believe, which is going to be very special. Surya Namaskar 108 times. But anyway, what I really wanted to start with is a really fascinating and interesting subject. And that is the uh, mind-body connection. And many people just don't realize how much uh, the mind and the body are connected. Because, uh, you see, for example, supposing I ask you to think of something that you love to eat, your favorite food. You think of your favorite food, when did you last eat it, and how it tasted, and the feeling of it in your mouth, and you're just thinking of that food that you're eating, and you love to eat it. And then as you're thinking about food and remembering the last time you ate it, you realize that there's saliva coming into your mouth. It's probably already happening now. It's happening for me. <laughs> and that really shows you that when you think of something, think of your favorite food, the brain sends the messages to the hypothalamus at the base of the brain, and that produces the hormones. And the hormones are sent out into the blood circulatory system and goes to the salivary glands and gives a message, you know, produce saliva because there's food coming now and you're going to need to digest it. And so there you've got your mind-body connection. It's really, uh, it's really strong. It's really clear in my opinion anyway. Another example of the mind-body connection is supposing you think of an argument that you had with someone recently. You know, you had some kind of conflict with someone, you had an argument, and you were really angry and frustrated. And, uh, and you're thinking, I wish you, you know, had said this, I wish you had said that, and you're reliving and you're going through the argument in your mind, and suddenly you realize that your the adrenaline is flowing through your body, and you're feeling angry at this moment, and your heart is beating faster, and you're breathing faster, and you realize that, yes, you know, that's having an effect on my mind, uh, sorry, on my body. I'm thinking of just remembering an argument, and that is pumping adrenaline into my body. So this is a really clear illustration of how the mind and what we're thinking is having an effect on our body. Now, if you... If you see that and then um, put it onto how what happens when we are under pressure and stress and anxiety, you know, we may be worrying about, you know, how am I going to make enough money to pay the bills or what am I going to do with my life or how am I going to uh, cope with the problems with my kids or whatever it is. Your mind is thinking and thinking and thinking. And you all know about the fight flight response. So as your mind is thinking something, those hormones and adrenaline and stuff is being pumped into your system and it's creating problems. The adrenaline is, is needing to express itself and, and uh, manifest itself. And if you don't let it out by running or doing something vigorous, then it's going to stay in your body and it's going to create toxins which will affect your muscles and your bones and everything. And then eventually, it's going to eat away at the weakest part of your being. And then you fall sick with a psychosomatic illness. So this is um, a very clear illustration of how the um, mind has an effect on the body. And another interesting thing is that every cell in our body is thinking when we are thinking. Because every cell in the body is a hologram of the whole body. So when you're, for example, if you're thinking, my knees are weak, then your knee cells, the cells in your knees are also thinking we're weak. And so your knees are going to become more weak. But on the other hand, if you change your thinking 
and say to yourself, my knees are getting stronger. Then your cells and your knees are going to think we're getting stronger and they're going to get stronger. So it's really, it's, it's not you know, whether it's a fact or not. It's the perspective with which you are looking at your knees. You can either think your knees are weak or you can think, well, they're getting stronger and stronger. So you've shifted your mind and thinking to the positive perspective of uh, what's happening in your knees. So you really have to be careful of what you're thinking. Uh, you know, they say that uh, thoughts become things. So you have to be careful of what you're thinking. And you see, sometimes we're consciously thinking of things that are very good. We're being very positive. We've got a positive sankalpa and we're doing all the right things. But still, we're getting these negative things happening and uh, this positive thinking doesn't seem to be working. Why is that? Because on the subconscious level, something else is going on. You see, we may be consciously thinking very good and positive thoughts, but underneath, due to some old negative thoughts, ideas and opinions uh, that were created when we were growing up and were being imprinted in our mind and they become uh, set in our hard drive, then those negative thoughts subconscious thoughts are going to sabotage the positive thoughts. So the thing is, what we have to do is be aware of what's happening underneath. So, you know, in yoga, we say that awareness is one of the most important things to develop. And one of the really good, useful things about awareness is that you can become aware of that subconscious level of your thinking. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing is, don't give up your positive thoughts. Keep thinking your positive thoughts. But also, through meditation, through awareness, become more and more aware of the subtle things that are happening within you. If you take time to sit quietly, you suddenly realize that there are other things going, much more subtle things that are going on in the atmosphere around and in your mind. And then as you go to the deep and deep levels through meditation, through awareness, you begin to observe. Sometimes you can even hear those thoughts coming up. You're saying something positive or you're in a situation and an inner voice says something to you that might be negative and self-destructive and you recognize, oh, this is something that I've heard from my childhood. Maybe an adult in my life was saying these things to try and encourage me to try harder or, you know, to help us to try and be good. Uh, usually, you know, uh, adults, when they're always trying to help their kids to be good, but sometimes they use a negative way of doing it, and that gets imprinted on our mind, so on our hard drive. So once you recognize those negative, recurring, self-destructive thoughts, then you can, uh, you can understand it, realize what it is, and replace it with an opposite positive thought. And um, this we can do this with sankalpa or um, a deep positive intention that we plant in the meditation, especially in something like yoga nidra. So uh, it's kind of a long-winded way of telling you about the mind-body connection and how it's really good to be thinking positive thoughts when we're aware. And also when we're doing things, sometimes we do things mechanically and our mind is somewhere else. But if we try and be aware and then bring our mind to the present moment and look at the positive situation in that moment, then it helps us to be really fully focusing all our energy on that and really enhancing, empowering what we are doing. So what about the body-mind connection? Have you ever uh, noticed that when you are doing a, have a good walk or a good um, uh, workout or some asanas, how good you feel afterwards? It's easy to, to realize that, isn't it? And this is the body-mind connection. For example, you might be feeling down, depressed or lethargic. You haven't got any attention. You're feeling in a low mood. And then something happens that demands get up 
and you deal with it. And then um, you realize, oh, it's quite different. I feel better. I feel more energetic. And your bad mood has vanished. So that's how the action and movement can help us to alleviate those negative, dull, and stuck uh, mental moods and attitudes. So it's really important to use our body uh, to release the, the uh, those deep, stuck um, thoughts that are connected there. You see, um, our body and mind is so much interlinked that the thoughts and the repressed feelings and the deep emotions are also on the physical level. So by moving the body, by doing asanas and any kind of physical uh, uh, movements, any kind of uh, physical activities, we are moving the muscles, we're releasing, we're stimulating the blood circulation, we're going deep into the, uh, the systems. Because it's not just the muscles and the joints, but it goes deeper into our systems to stimulate the respiratory system, the blood circulatory, the digestive, and all those things go and get affected. And that is connected through the nerves and through the brain. And so it's going to have an effect even on the physical level, not only on the mental and the energetic level. And so when you do asanas, when you do any kind of physical um, activities, you're releasing those deep-seated tensions from the mind. And you're releasing those deep karmas and seeds of the past that are stored in the memory and the muscles. So it's like the coming back to the knees, you know. Um, when, when you're doing, you might have some knee problem and you do some uh, knee movements to lubricate the knees and then the knees are feeling good and then that has effect on your mind. So it works both ways. The mind has an effect on the body, and the body has an effect on the mind. And, you know, uh, we've heard that our bodies are 70% liquid, and that water has memory. Uh, you know, from that Japanese um, scientist's work on snowflakes and water crystals, he showed that what we're thinking has an effect on the water. And if we're 70% uh, water or liquid, then what we're thinking is having an effect on that fluids in our body. So if we can train our minds to be thinking positive, to see the, be the, the beauty and the uh, good things about whatever we're doing, then that's going to have a wonderful effect on our body. And um, um, definitely it's just a perspective, you know, it's training your mind to have a particular perspective. So yoga is not just asanas. Um, you know, we think that, that uh, we're just the body or we're just the mind. And uh, many people say, oh, well, I do yoga, so I should be fine. Uh, but the thing is, you know, yoga is so vast and you can do yoga in any way. Uh, in the olden days, if someone said, I do asanas, you had an image of someone standing on their head or sitting in lotus pose. And uh, nowadays, if someone says, I do yoga, you, uh, you have an image of someone doing some strenuous workout, wearing fancy leggings. And um, there's no harm in this. You know, all those physical activities are really good for us because you want to keep your body fit and healthy because it's the vehicle of all the other subtle parts of yourself, especially in these days of internet. Here we are sitting looking at the internet. Even, especially in these days of sedentary living and internet, we do need uh, all those physical activities and, and asanas and whatever that we can do to keep our bodies in good, healthy condition. But yoga just isn't, it's not only asanas, it's, it's just, asanas is about 5% or even less of the fasting of yoga. Because what does yoga mean? It means union or harmony a union between body, mind, and soul, or union of myself with the divine, or union of the self with the group. And one great way of being in union with the group is through chanting. And that's what we do in my ashram. Every morning at 6 a.m., every evening at 8 p.m., we get together as a group and we chant together. 
And when you're chanting together, you forget everything else. You're just focusing on the chanting. You put aside your own ideas. You have to adjust your speed, your pronunciation, your tune, your rhythm, and you're all chanting together as one, oneness. So you're coming together as one. And when you finish, you feel so good because you've forgotten all your problems and the mantras are having their effect on your mind and your body complex. And so this is also a yoga. But we never think of chanting mantras together as a yoga. So really, yoga is a very vast thing. And, you know, if you look at the, the famous holy book, Bhagavad Gita, the whole thing is about yoga. 18 chapters and on every page, uh, the word yoga is there. But there's not a single lesson. So there are so many different ways of practicing yoga. And you can choose your favorite way. You could be doing meditation, which is one way of getting into oneness. Or jnana yoga, the yoga of the intellect, of inquiring, of self-inquiry. Or bhakti yoga, the yoga of channelizing your emotions, that anger and that frustration, using it in a positive way to reach the divine, to be of service, and to, to express that uh, emotion through love and devotion. Or you could be doing karma yoga, which uses all aspects of our being to, uh, in the way of how do we do our things, what is our attitude, and how do we do our actions, and what is our involvement with them, and uh, how well we can do it. So there are many different yogas that you can do. And the uh, thing is to, uh, whatever is your favorite yoga, do it, and it's going to have wonderful effect on you. And each yoga, covers a different aspect of your being. So we do asanas with the body, and we do meditation with the mind, and we do pranayama with the energy body, and uh, we do the, the higher and deeper yogas of the intellect uh, with the wisdom mind. So there are many different levels of our being. And just briefly, one of the ancient the yogis gave us a really good framework to uh, express, to understand the different levels of our being. And it's called the pancha koshas. The pancha koshas, pancha means five, and kosha means coverings, layers, sheets. And this is a really uh, simple and good way of uh, describing the different levels of our being. And the first of the pancha koshas is the anname kosha. Anna means food or uh, rice. And the Anna Mayakosha is called the food body because we need food to maintain this body. Body is the physical most solid part of our being. And so we need solid food to maintain it and uh, keep it going. But there are also subtle aspects. For example, the mind. The mind. If you, can you see the mind? Can you open a brain and see the mind there? Can you show me your mind? No. But it's definitely there. It's very real. We experience our mind through our thoughts. And it's very real. And the maname kosha is the mind. But between the mind and the body, we have the praname kosha. The praname kosha is the energy body. It's the life energy. That energy that enables us to do everything in life. Uh, talking, listening, uh, interacting, everything. It's just like petrol in a car. You can have a perfectly good car, but if you don't have petrol in it, you can't make it go. So the petrol in our being is the prana, the life force energy. And uh, then we have the mind, which is the mind of the senses, taking in information from the outer world, processing it, and interacting with the outer world. And then we have the higher mind, the wisdom mind, which is the Vijnanamaya Kosha, and then we have the deepest aspect, the Anandamaya Kosha, the bliss body, the core, the essence of our being, where the deep-seated karmas and samskaras are stored. And each of these parts of our being are all interlinked, and all the different yogas address the different aspects of our being, so that we can experience that deepest, highest level that spark of life within us. And what I'd like to do is try and give you a little experience of the Pancha Koshas with a little Yoga Nidra meditation on the Pancha Koshas. 
So let's see if we can find uh, a comfortable position, either lying down in Shavasana or sitting in your comfortable meditation asana or sitting in an armchair or whatever. It'll just be about 10 or 15 minutes, but you should be comfortable so that you can be still and that you can go deeper than your body and go deeper, deeper. I'm going to take you step by step deeper and deeper and see if you can experience your ananda me kosha and then come back out. And then we'll talk a little bit more about koshas. So please settle yourselves down into your comfortable position. Either in Shavasana lying down or sitting in a comfortable chair or in your meditation asana. And gently close your eyes. And feel the shape and position of your physical body. And check that it feels balanced and symmetrical, adjusting so that it does. And feel the solidness and stillness of your physical body resting against its support, the floor or the chair or whatever. And know that this is the feeling of the physical body, the Annamaya Kosha, the vehicle of all the other subtle aspects of our being. Feel that solidness. The feeling of solidness and security against the solidness of the floor. And within the solidness of your body, you begin to feel the gentle, subtle movement of your breath. Be careful not to change the natural rhythm of your breathing. Just let your breathing be relaxed and natural. Just focus on the feeling of the movement of the breath. You can feel the gentle rising and falling of your chest or the gentle rising and falling of your abdomen. And know that the prana, the energy of the aura, the life force energy, is moving with each breath, enabling us to breathe and be alive. Focus on that rhythm of your breath. Let it soothe you and relax you. We may not be able to see the prana, but 
we can feel the movement as we breathe. Because it's only when we're alive with prana that we breathe. And now, take your awareness to the sounds that you can hear around you. Listen to the sounds. Without thinking of the cause of the sounds. And know that the sounds are happening and the ears are receiving the sounds and the mind is processing them. And normally you would be reacting to those sounds. And this is the Manameya Kosha, the rational thinking mind that takes in the information of the world around us through our senses, processes it and reacts and interacts with the world around us. the manname kosha. And now, come back, come back to the breath. And once again, focus on the breath without changing it. And focus on your exhale breath. Exhale breath is letting go. Letting go of carbon dioxide, toxins and waste products. And because the energy is moving with each breath, we can also let go the energy of thoughts and of tensions and anxiety. So with each exhale breath, just let go. Let go of those worries and anxieties and tensions and just feel that you're emptying your mind with each outgoing breath. Letting the rhythm and movement of your breathing soothe you and relax you. Letting go. And now, remember a recent happy memory. It could have been just a small moment when you were speaking to a friend or whatever. Remember a recent happy moment, happy memory. See clearly where it took place. See clearly what was happening, who was there. And who lived that happy memory vividly now? <coughs> Knowing that as you see and relive that happy memory, you're experiencing your vijnana mekosha, your creative mind, your wisdom mind. The mind that dreams at night and daydreams too. 
and keep reliving that happy memory, knowing that you're operating from that part of your being, the creative mind, the vijnana kosha. And as you relive that happy memory, focus on the feeling of happiness. You're reliving that happy memory. Focus on the feeling of happiness. Eyes gently closed. Focusing on reliving that happy memory. And perhaps that happy state that you're enjoying now is the Ananda Mekosha, the bliss body, the core of your being, the contentment when you're at peace with yourself and the world. Try and go a little deeper to that core of yourself, the real you behind everything else, behind all your thoughts and feelings and actions and opinions and experiences. And notice how you feel in this state. And know that you can achieve this state by yourself, by doing the practices. And now come back, bringing back with you the inner experiences, insights, and energy. Come back gently, gently. Come back to that happy memory and see clearly that happy memory what was happening and where it was happening. Awakening that positive energy within you. Come back to the movement of the breathing in your body. Feel the breath moving in your body. Know that you're alive. And that the life force is moving within you, behind each breath. Come back to the sounds around us. Listen to the sounds. And know that the listening is happening in your Madame culture, the rational thinking mind. And come back to the physical body, the solid vehicle that carries all the other subtle aspects of our being. The Anna Kosha, the food body. And come back 
to the floor or chair or cushion that you're resting against. And know that that sensation of the physical body against its support is a sensation of the Anamya Kosha. And come back to your surroundings and know where you are at this moment. And take a few deep breaths in and out to break the stillness of your body. And we'll finish off in the traditional way by chanting on three times together, sending love and thanks to the world around. Join me if you wish. Take a deep breath in. Oh. Finish off with palming. Rub the palms together and the left heart. Close your eyes. Take in the energy generated from your palms into your eyes and brain to energize and refresh them. And then gently open your eyes with a smile on your face. And I'm the lucky one to receive that smile. But keep that smile and give it to the next person that you see. And get in the habit of smiling and sharing the smile because it generates so much positive energy. And relax your posture. Have a big stretch if you like. And make yourself quite comfortable. So I hope you're able to relax nicely and also to experience the uh, different levels of your being. And we're going to uh, explore this a little bit more detail on Wednesday when we have an introduction to prana, pranayama, sorry, because um, uh, the pranayama is based in the pranamaya kosha. And it's really good to be aware of the different koshas, the different levels or aspects of our being, and to be aware of them at any time of the day. So you're doing something physical, you're out in the jogging or gymming or whatever, you know, okay, this is my body, this is my anamaya kosha. You're thinking of something and you're focusing or, you know, you realize you're thinking, ah, huh, you're listening to a sound, okay, this is my manamaya kosha. You're having a little daydream and imagining something nice. Oh, or you're having a creative idea or a flash of intuition. Ah, this is my big, must be my big anime kosha. And then you feel totally at peace with yourself and this that. Maybe this is my anime kosha. Because you know, all the different yogas are done with the different koshas to help us to reach that deepest core of our being to recognize it, identify with it, and then rest in it for as much as we can. So this is the beauty of yoga, is that uh, you can do any yoga. You can do asanas, you can do pranayams, you can do meditation. You, you can just be inquiring and thinking and contemplating. The jnana yoga, the yoga of the intellect, or if you're an emotional person, you could be singing and serving and, um, you know, doing karma yoga to help people. That gives a lot of satisfaction. So whatever is your favorite yoga, do that. And uh, if possible, do a little of the others because we all have bodies. So we need to keep fit and healthy. We all have minds. We need to relax the mind every now and then, empty it, focus it, refresh it. 
We all have energy. It's good to keep the energies balanced and cleansed and to use our energy to increase and increase more. So uh, most of us have a favorite path, but we also have different aspects of our being. And if you want to keep them healthy and harmonized, it's good to do a little bit of everything. I'll give you sessions this week. Today we have the introduction, and tomorrow we're going to have a session on asanas at 5, 5 p.m. same time. And on Wednesday we're going to have introduction to uh, pranayam, which I'll be giving, and on Thursday, introduction to Yoga Nidra, the famous, wonderful uh, relaxation meditation done lying down in Shavasana, greatest way to relax, and then Friday, introduction to meditation. And if you're the biggest physical type, on Saturday, early in the morning at 7 a.m., 108 Surya Namaskars, I'll be leaving. Are there any feedbacks or questions? You can click your, uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask any questions or give any feedback. And Sudipta, if you're there, if you think there's something that you'd like me to say, just let me know. Swamiji, we can open up for questions, I think. Yeah. So if there's someone here who's asked a question, how can I give up my unnecessary thoughts while I'm studying? You see, what happens when you're studying is you're focusing fully on one thing, Ekagrata. You're focusing your mind on one thing. It's a form of meditation because you're harnessing all your mental energy on one thing. And as you're focusing on one thing, like a meditation, things are bubbling up to the surface. This is actually a good thing. It's a process of chitta shuddhi. So you're fully focused, but then your mind goes here. Oh, then your mind goes there. And you say, oh my God, it's disturbing me. I want to be studying. I don't want to be lingering, thinking of this and that. So what you have to do is, when that happens, simply be aware, oh, my mind has gone off, it's okay. Now let me bring it back and continue my studies. Then again, the mind goes off, it's okay. Let, now let me bring it back. It's when you get lost in the thoughts, that's when you lose your concentration. So as long as you can be aware, you see, this is why, the trick of yoga is to be aware, to develop awareness more and more and more. Observation. Observation of how you're feeling, uh, of what you're thinking, how you're reacting, how the other person is reacting, how what your behavior has effect on the other person. So awareness can do everything. Whatever you want to do in life, awareness will help you do it. And study too. The study you know, if you, if you find that what you're studying very interesting, it'll be easy to concentrate. But what the trouble is, we expect our minds to be concentrating 24 hours a day practically. Because um, if you, especially if you're young and you're studying and you do a lot of mental work, your mind gets tired and it wants to have a break. So you should take a break and you should do something physical. Do a few rounds of Surya Namaskar or jog around the block, or run up and down the stairs, get the blood circulation, you know, switch your mind off by putting it on the physical, feel what's happening in your body, do some deep breathing, get everything uh, cleansed and balanced and, and um, uh, have, give the mind a break. Then come back to your studies and it will be very easy. So two things, when your mind goes off, just realize it's gone off, it's okay, and bring it back. Keep bringing it back. Three things. The second thing is, try and feel that you're really interested in the subject. What is this about? I want to find out. The more interested you are in it, the easier it will be able to concentrate. You never have trouble concentrating on a good movie, do you? No. So like that, make yourself interested in the topic. And the third thing is, give yourself a break and do some physical things in between so that the 
your blood is circulating and your mind has some freshness. So there's another, um, thank you, Shaya. And there's another question uh, there in the chat, but I can't see it at the moment. I can read it out for you. Thank uh, you. Ma'am, I am a UPSC aspirant. How could I control my mind from overthinking? I also have migraine. What should I do? Yeah. Well, uh, you should take advantage of overthinking and harness your mental energy. So probably if you're overthinking, a lot of creative thoughts are coming in. So use those creative thoughts in a positive way. For example, if you are, you know, I'm uh, getting anxious about the talks that I'm giving on the Zoom and my mind is going round and round. So I harness that energy and I be creative in thinking, well, how am I going to explain this? And how am I going to put this way? And so I'm using that thinking power and creative uh, thinking and your, your, all those thoughts, but channelizing it into what I want to think about. So it could be if you're interested in cooking, you know, you could give yourself a, a break from your, your, your studies or your work. And you could think of, oh, yeah, we could have this wonderful dish and I could do this, this, and this. Or if you're interested in clothes, you could think of, you know, how are you going to dress up for some occasion? Or if you're interested in sports, you could be thinking of how you're playing a game. So whatever your mind is interested in, let it go into that thing to use up that excess energy in being creative or in daydreaming. And then come back to the topic that you're studying. Because that going off into something creative or, or uh, imaginative is kind of like giving the mind a break. It's, uh, so you can give your mind a break by doing that and also by doing something physical and by just changing and doing something totally different, like having a little conversation with your friend on the phone or going and looking at the plants and you know, seeing if they need some water or petting your cat. So whatever it is, a change is as good as a holiday. So give yourself a bit of a change and uh, that will help you to, to release that uh, excess mental energy and allow your mind a little bit of leeway so that it's ready to come back. I hope that answers your question. We have one more. Uh, how effective is yoga for, uh, for the weight loss journey? Yeah, it's very, very effective. And, you know, we have a really nice sankalpa for weight loss. And that is, I will um, I'll exercise more, eat less, and be positive. I'll eat less, exercise more, and be positive. You see, um, there are so many reasons for putting on weight. I think lockdown is one reason. <laughs> because you can't go off, you can't go out, and there's... Uh, you know, lots to eat. There's nothing to do but eat, so you put on weight. So um, yoga is really good because uh, you can do the very physically physical in big, vigorous yogas, and that will help you to um, to release the, uh, to use up the calories, and it'll help you to keep fit and healthy. Um, but you can also use your mind to think positively and have a sankalpa like you know the one I've just mentioned. I will eat less, exercise more, and be positive. And then uh, relaxing. Because some, some people, they eat more when they're feeling tense and anxious. It's kind of like a comfort food eating. So if you relax and do your nidra, then uh, you'll be able to overcome that uh, to a great extent. And um, also awareness. If you can develop awareness and see when are you eating more, uh, and then you can, you know, you can plan your eating so that you eat a little less each meal, eat a little less so that your stomach reduces in size and have the little rules like, you know, don't eat in between meals. I'm sure you know all of these things. Um, but very much relaxation uh, and, of course, choosing the food that you're eating, uh, relaxation, exercise, and um, good diet or eating less will help you a lot. Unless you've got some kind of a therapeutic problem like thyroidism or diabetes or whatever, even then yoga can help you a lot because the asanas will work on the uh, organs and to balance the organs and the hormones and uh, to, to uh, strengthen and boost up your immune system. 
So uh, yoga is really very good for, for that as well as many other things. I'm sure we have a couple of questions about um, depression, um, how to reduce depression, uh, how to avoid thinking of um, negative thoughts, um, and a feeling of uh, they're less compared to everyone else. So I have this, a similar question, like a couple of people have messaged me privately as well about the same thing, uh, about worrying subconsciously and uh, trying to come out of uh, constant st sadness. Mm -hmm. See, basically, there are two kinds of depression. There's the clinical depression, which is a depression due to chemical imbalance in the brain, and it doesn't have any specific reason why you're sad. You're just sad seemingly for no reason, or you're sad in the morning, but you get better during the evening, or you're sad in the evening, whatever it is. So that's a clinical uh, depression which doesn't have a reason. And then there's a the reactive depression, which is depression due to some reaction. For example, you lost your job, and then you get into a pit of depression because of that. Or you lost someone in your life, or some trauma happened, you get depressed because of that. Now, if it's a reactive depression and it happens because of something that happened in your life, meditation and yoga nidra is very good for it because it will help you to go deeper into your mind to realize what is the thing and to allow it to come up and let it go. And it will help you also to tap into the joy and beauty uh, within yourself like we did with the happy memory a moment ago. So yoga nidra meditation... Um, and awareness is really good for uh, reactive depression, for relaxing and getting over trauma. And it's quite, you know, you can, there are lots of really good practices that you'd have to go deeper into. But with clinical depression, uh, doing meditation, you'll know, it's not so good. Because in clinical depression, you're already too much in the mind. You're already spending too much time in your inner world. And what you need is to pull yourself out to the external world and, and extrovert yourself more. So in that kind of depression where you're getting sad and depressed for no reason at all, it's really, really important to do physical things, to make yourself extrovert. You know, you, you might wake up early in the morning and you're lying in the bed and your mind is going round and round thinking all kinds of terrible thoughts. You should get out of bed at that moment and have a cup of whatever you like to drink and then go outside, you know, go walking on the terrace or go to a park or, you know, walking in the streets is fine. Do deep breathing, anything to get yourself out and see the world around you, get yourself out of your mind and connecting with the external world. That will really help. And for that kind of depression also, anything physical, Arsons, gymming, jogging, dancing is great, swimming is great. You have to make yourself physical. And if you're living on your own, it's really not suitable for depression. You should try and live with other people, either in your own family or with a group of people or in an ashram or a hostel so that you can be always linked with other people. And uh, if you're suffering from that kind of uh, clinical uh, um, depression, it's really good to be active helping other people, help the elderly people or help children, go and volunteer and help children to learn something, uh, do, you know, activities, even in your own house if you're living with your family, wash your own clothes, clean your own room, uh, help in, the, in cutting of the vegetables, do some gardening, get some plants and pots, get pets, pets are wonderful for depression. So a lot of really good things you can do to get over clinical depression. But it's really good to have a friend that you can link with. So when you're feeling down, you just ring up that person and say, I'm feeling down. And then that person can help you to remember. And it's really important not to, uh, not to compare yourself with people who are better than yourself. Always compare yourself with people who are worse off. You know something? Anyone who's here in this Zoom session is one of the 1% in the world population. Now, if we're one in the 1% of the world population, there's 99% of people who are worse off than us, who've got less to eat, 
who don't have the luxury of a mobile or a laptop, who are not educated enough, who are struggling to survive. So remember, compare yourself with those people and count your blessings, count your lucky stars. This is also a really good technique to get over depression. Just think of the things that you have got. I've got two good legs, I've got two good hands, I've got enough clothes to wear, you know, I've got parents. Whatever it is, you just keep thinking of the things that you take for granted and that will really help you come up. We have several questions, Swamiji, but I think we have time for only a couple more. Um, the next one is, uh, how do I di divert my mind from physical pain? Though I force the mind to be positive, sometimes pain overrides the thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Physical pain. Yeah, it's a difficult one, but it is possible. You see, you may have physical pain, and then someone that you like very much rings you up and starts talking to you, and you forget your pain. You're totally involved in that uh, conversation with your friend. And you suddenly realize that you forgot all your pain. And it might, the pain might even disappear because you stop thinking about it. So you can divert your mind. But it's, of course, it's easy for me to say. But if you're experiencing pain, you have to kind of train yourself to divert your mind. So get involved. Of course, one thing is do something about it. For example, there are really good, soft, gentle asanas which will help you to heal. And there are meditations also which will help you. If you have some kind of, um, um, you know, uh, pain which is not, you know, overcomable, uh, for example, phantom pains, then you can do, uh, your organism is really excellent, especially the body rotation, mental rotation and the body parts. And um, meditation is really good. Healing your organism is really good for overcoming pain. But also to get involved in activities that will distract you from the pain. And there's also very good breathing practices to breathe in healing energy and breathe out the pain and the problem. So uh, maybe we can have a, a, a healing uh, session sometime or a pain management session sometime to go deeper into it. And I was going to suggest that we could end now and then if anyone does have some questions or feedback, um, if they... Uh, if uh, uh, Eka meditation will allow them to stay on. That's fine by me. So, um, what do you want to do, Sadiq? Oh, we have one more question, Swamiji, uh, about uh, stress and anxiety mm -hmm. and um, how to deal with uh, that. Mm -hmm. Managing stress and anxiety. Any particular techniques? Yeah. Well, um, stress and anxiety, the root cause of it is in the mind in how we react to our situation. It's a perspective. So uh, knowing that it's in the mind, we can use the mind to get out of it. And um, we, can, we can use breathing, for example. We did a little bit just earlier where we focus on the breath, focusing on the exhale the breath, feel that you're letting go of the stresses, letting go of the worries, breathing out your thoughts. Because you know, stress, anxiety, and thoughts our energy and energy moves with the breath so just by breathing out and releasing you can release those things but you have to focus on it really believe that you're doing it the more you believe in it the better it works and then of course your middle is a really great way of kind of immediate relaxation and letting go of stress and anxiety and uh, getting involved in, a, in activity for example if you're busy uh, doing something to help others or you're busy cooking a meal for your family, you probably won't be thinking of that stress and anxiety because your mind is totally involved in something else. So activities, especially to help others, is really good for getting over stress and anxiety. Doing, having a hobby or an activity that uh, nourishes your soul. You know, maybe you're, you're really working hard in the IT and you're spending hours and hours doing that and it's really giving you a lot of stress and anxiety. So then choose something, a hobby or something that really nourishes you or read a good book, an uplifting book. And that way you can distract yourself from the stress and anxiety. And once you've done that, then your mind is fresh.
especially your nidra. If you do your nidra just for 10, 15 minutes, your mind is fresh. Um, and they come back to your daily life with a fresh perspective and you can handle the things you found impossible before. So uh, uh, have a look at all the meditations in the uh, Eka Meditation app. There are some lovely yoga nidras and meditations there. Thank you, Kavita. A lot of people are uh, saying thank you, Samji. I'm not sure if you're able to read the messages. Yeah, I'm just reading. I'm just enjoying the you. session. Um, we also have a question, and maybe this could be our last question. Um, I have certain goals that I know I want to get done. I'm capable of doing it, but when I sit to do a task, my mind jumps to the next task. And then from there, I want to come back to the first one. Mm -hmm. I find it boring. So what can I do? Boring? I find it frustrating. The same thing happens to me. <laughs> yeah, the same thing happens to me. So, uh, yeah, it's again uh, the thing of awareness. Be aware that that's what your mind is doing and then realize that you can train your mind to focus uh, on the thing that you want to do. So, for example, supposing you're doing an activity and you're thinking of the next one, you realize, oh, I'm thinking of the next one. Okay, let me bring my mind back. It's okay. Keep bringing your mind back. Make it okay. If you say it's okay, then you don't get stressed about it. And when you're not stressed, you're relaxing. And when you're relaxing, then the energy flows. And then the thing will happen. So awareness is such a wonderful tool for everything in life. Just be aware. And with awareness, acceptance. You see that you're aware that your mind is gone, but also accept. It's okay. And then keep bringing your mind back. And don't be too hard on yourself. Just make it okay and be thankful that you've got such a good mind that it's thinking of so many different things at once. You know, if you, if you develop gratitude, that's a wonderful thing to make you happy and to make you relaxed and to enjoy life more. So I think those are all the questions, Swamiji, that we had. Um, for those who are asking about the recording, we're going to try and make that happen. We are recording the session and we'll try to um, put it up. Uh, just be in touch with us. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. Hari Om Tat Sat. Hope to see you again. God bless. Yeah, please join us uh, all week. Uh, we are here every day, 5 to 6. And on... Um, Saturday and Sunday at 7 o'clock. Oh. <laughs> okay. See you all. Hope to see you tomorrow at 5 as well. Tomorrow's session is on asanas. Bye, everybody. Hello.